All right. Well, welcome back, everybody, mm -hmm. to Equipped. If you, if this is your first time here, Larry and Emily, looking at you, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bird. Uh, <laughs> welcome. We're glad to have you, Isaiah. You too. Mm -hmm. Got to make everyone <laughs> uncomfortable who hasn't been here before. But um, yeah, welcome back. This is our little theology discipleship apologetics course where we just kind of want to get people excited about the faith that they believe in and give solid evidence as to why they believe and equip people in order to send them out into the world confident that what they believe is the truth. Yeah. So before we get started, we have a couple announcements. Um, if you want to check out the website uh, to see the schedule, you can do that so you'll know what's upcoming. And if you want to do a little research ahead of time, that's fine. Um, give us the hard questions, maybe. Just as a um, side note, that does that may get updated if we <laughs> end up going over. Because like mm -hmm. some of these courses might be too in-depth for one week. So we might have to adjust the schedule throughout the year, but it will be updated as we are updating the schedule. So that's like, go to New Hearts Ministries. It's the first thing that's on there. There's a PDF with the full schedule. Mm -hmm. And if you miss a week, uh, you can always subscribe, shameless plug, uh, to the Christian Boys, <laughs> and we'll upload every uh, Monday after. So basically, we'll do this one Monday, and the next Monday will be uploaded. So if you miss one or you know don't want to come to one and just want to speed through it, that's fine too. Um, <laughs> Listen on double speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we do to everybody, just yep. double speed. So, uh, And then we also are going to introduce a weekly test uh, to jog your memory on what we discuss. So we'll kind of show that at the end and kind of how we'll do that. Oh, um, whoops, I put this in the wrong order. Oh, did whoops. you? Oh, whoops. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all going to be said, so it doesn't yeah. matter. Uh, and then again, we recommend taking notes. Uh, bring your Bible, whatever you need to do. That way you can uh, be ready for the course. And again, hopefully you do better on the test that way too. So <laughs> Yeah. And again, it's optional. You don't have to take the test. We just figure that we're going to tell you what we're going to tell you, tell you, and then remind you what we told you. Mm -hmm. And then you can remind yourself what we told you. Mm -hmm. So it'll really stick, if that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> all right. So let's get into our topic for tonight. We're going to argue that God exists. Believe it or not, that is pretty foundational to Christianity, that there is a God and that he has revealed himself to us. Uh, now, this is what usually comes up. You you're in a conversation with someone and they ask, does God exist? Right? Obviously, your answer is yes. <laughs> of course. Yes, he exists. And then they would respond, can you prove he exists? No. Because you can't prove what would be on a shadow of a doubt that he does or does not exist. So... Exactly. That's the point. Can you prove that he does? No. Can you prove that he doesn't? No. So then they would ask, so then how do you know? Right? It's a super common question. This comes up all the time. It doesn't have to come up specifically even from uh, people who reject the existence of God. Um, you know, people who reject the existence of God obviously are people who are known as atheists. And atheists and agnostics, which are people who don't know whether or not there is a God, they just are on the fence. Um, it's growing in number exponentially in the United States, has been growing year over year, every year for a long time. According to a 2022 Gallup poll, the, Ameri uh, the American Religious Association said that Protestant Christians make up about 34% of our nation. Uh, Catholic Christians make up about 23%. So Christianity as a whole is over half of our country. Uh, but non-affiliated or slash atheists uh, have gone up 15% since 1998 to about 21% of our nation. Now, you might think like a 15% increase over 25 years, that's not that many, but that's 50 million people. That's 50 million people that were made in God's image that he loves deeply and dearly and that we should be very interested <laughs> in trying to reach with not only the truth of who God has revealed himself to be, but with just the, the truth. Like, if anyone is interested in truth, truth will set you free, as Jesus says. And so we don't want people to be believing lies, whether or not they are standing in our camp or not. So we should be interested in sharing the truth with them, if just so that they would be confident in what is the truth. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I use the word truth a lot. No, but, I mean, <laughs> Yeah. So the question was, what is the difference between atheism and agnosticism? Mm -hmm. um, atheism is the belief that there is no deity that exists. Agnosticism is not knowing whether or not a deity exists, so not making a solid judgment. So, or, or it's the belief that we can't know whether or not a deity exists. So no one should be believing in a god. They're so, kind of in the same realm, just yeah. different sides. It's like different sides of a coin, really. I mean, it's, it's not uh, much difference there. <laughs> yeah. But I think that explains it well. Atheist is a firm belief. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Or, or the more honest, <laughs> or the more honest. Honestly, mm -hmm. I think honestly, agnosticism is more honest than mm -hmm. atheism 
Because you can't prove either way whether or not God exists. You can't prove it. You can provide evidence either way, but you can't prove it. An agnostic wants to point to that and say, because we can't prove it, we can't know. Therefore, you shouldn't make a solid judgment. And I'm like, I disagree. I think the evidence is persuasive that there is a God. Atheists also disagree, but for the other reason. They think that there's no persuasive evidence for a God. Agnostics just sit in the middle. Uh, a little quick aside, too. We'll, uh, anytime y'all ask a question, we're going to try and repeat it. That way people online can hear what's going on because they won't be able to pick you up from our mic. So yeah. uh, just if you hear us doing that, that's why. But please feel free to interject with questions. Yeah. This is not like a structured, you can't talk until we're done. <laughs> no, like, please interject. Mm -hmm. So I think that leads great into our next point. So part of this discussion, uh, we have to understand that these arguments are not to prove us right. Um, when I say that, it's not to go and beat atheists over the head with. Um, these are simply observations uh, through reality that prove God's existence. It's not only for us to, or, uh, excuse me, not only for us to ground our faith, but also when we are asked these questions, to be able to have an answer. Um, typically, atheists are not out evangelizing their opinions, but sometimes you get in those um, discussions and you need to be ready to, to show those answers. Um, also, uh, you could receive this from anyone. It could be coworkers. It could be you know people who are you know just trying to understand what is your worldview. So it's we're not just targeting atheists or agnostic here. We're targeting anybody that wants to know why we believe what we believe. Mm -hmm. um, and then so, how can we know that God is really there and know He really exists? So historically, a lot of arguments have been put forth that su provide support to the statement that God exists. Here's 20 of them. <laughs> uh, we're obviously not going to go through 20 arguments. That's a lot of arguments. But if you want to take a picture of this or write them down, feel free. There's a lot of good arguments for God's existence that are uh, defended philosophically or scientifically or uh, like theologically, obviously. <laughs> um, and I would recommend checking out, at the bottom of the screen, we do put our sources for any time we reference an argument, or if you want to look up more information on it, I'd recommend checking out that source, because that's usually the best place to find the information. Mm -hmm. We're just going to go through five arguments over the next two weeks, or, well, next two sessions, because we only meet every other week. Um, and so when it comes to explaining what we believe, these arguments the, like the actual wording of these arguments has been in intentionally laid out to be the most concise way to put our arguments. And sometimes people will try to like, you know, fight back against you or object to your argument by like, define, like uh, twisting what you mean by words or trying to uh, get around what you mean in words. And this, the way we're phrasing these arguments are intentionally designed to be the most concise and clear way and most philosophically defensible way to support that God exists. So, but before we begin talking through these arguments, we do want to clarify when it's appropriate to use these arguments in the first place. Um, so again, you know, we want to kind of go back to the heart of this. And so if people only want to mock and ridicule your faith, uh, don't bother answering them. <laughs> yeah. um, simple enough. We got a verse for that. That's Matthew 7, 6. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So, again, this goes back to the heart posture of having that wisdom in the sermon, when to share, when not to share. Understanding who just wants to tear you down and who wants to have a genuine understanding and reconcile reality. Um, but even if you encounter these people, there are things we can do. One of them being pray for them. Uh, we need to earnestly pray for people who are lost and people who do not know God, uh, atheists or agnostic or you know, even those who are outside of our religion and different religions. Uh, we need to be fervently praying for them. Um, and then uh, if these arguments are sincere questioners and to build your confidence uh, in the existence um, of God, uh, we have 2 Corinthians 5.20 which says, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. So again, it goes back to that wisdom in the sermon. We need to have these uh, arguments ready to be able to give it when it's time. So Yeah, to, yeah. to fill that out a little more, when Jesus is talking about you know, not casting your pearls before pigs, um, he is not meaning to be <laughs> insulting by saying that, like, oh, these idiots are just not understanding. He's saying, have wisdom when presenting this information. Recognize in your audience, if they don't care about an answer and they're just looking to make fun of you, you are under no obligation to defend 
that God exists. You're just not. God's a big boy. He can take care of himself. He doesn't need you to defend him. Uh, that said, we are ambassadors for Christ. So even if someone's coming up against you and is like, ha ha, you, you believe in God, you, you fool, like, you just, like these bunch of Iron Age idiots out in the desert wrote all this stuff 3,000 years ago, and so you just believe it because. It's like if somebody tried to say that to you, you could just say, you know what? Um, I believe what I believe, and I love you, and my God tells me to pray for you. So I'm going to do that. But if this is the kind of tone that we're going to have in an argument, we're not going to talk about it. And there's nothing at all wrong with saying that. Yeah, typically you see in like the straw man arguments, you know, yeah. so like what you were saying, you know, they try and make something out of nothing. And it's like, well, that's not actually how it works. And you know, it's not. They're just <laughs> trying to, you know, basically belittle you. So no win to not. <laughs> yeah. Now that said, because we're ambassadors for Christ, we need to do everything we can to not lose our witness before people. So like getting angry or getting uh, exasperated to the point where we're now demeaning other people who, again, were made in the image of Christ or of God. Um, we need to be careful about preserving the evidence of Christ's character in us when we're coming up against people who are not in the same camp as us when it comes to belief. Uh, does that all make sense? Yeah? Fantastic. Uh, if you do encounter someone who seriously wants to know, they sincerely want to know the arguments, start by asking why they want to know. Right? Sometimes people are looking for answers to tough questions in life. Like, for example, why God would allow a loved one to suffer or why they lost this amazing opportunity or things like that. If that happens, it might change the way that you respond. Not everyone's looking for a logical, philosophically sound, syllogistic argument for God's existence. Sometimes they're just looking for a shoulder to cry on or they're looking for a friend to talk to. So asking why someone's approaching this question is also incredibly important. Often that's the case. They're not looking for a textbook answer. But if they are looking for an intellectual argument as to why you think God exists, you can give them these arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, so ensure you know what your audience's needs are before you step into the conversation. Um, quick side note, we are going to talk about why a good God would allow suffering and the, the common questions of Christianity. They actually got the most votes out of anything last week. So we will be covering that towards the end of the spring semester, I guess. Um, so just check the schedule for that. Yeah. So now that we're going to get into the topics, some of the things we need to understand is that these have been, all of the topics we're going to talk about have been defended uh, rigorously by uh, scholars, philosophers, theologians, and even some of this is science. So we're going to get into it deep and, and understand that this is not something somebody just put out. It's been proven through. Um, so these, uh, these have compelling counter arguments as well, uh, which you may find more persuasive, you know, and uh, again, we're not here to tell you what to believe. We're just going to present the evidence in the best way possible and obviously tell you what we think. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's always a counter argument to any argument. Um, so when it comes right down to it, you have to decide uh, which you find more persuasive, obviously. Uh, secondly, there are only arguments that, uh, excuse me, secondly, they, uh, these are only arguments that any God could exist. So basically what we're trying to say is that this is just the argument for God. Um, any God. Not, yeah, yeah. It could be the God of Islam, the mm -hmm. God of Mormonism, the God of any other religion. It's not specifically Christianity. We will get to that, just not this week. Yes. Uh, and then finally, most of these arguments are arranged uh, syllogistically, uh, meaning a conclusion formed by the set uh, of supporting points. Um, so again, you don't need to memorize these things. Uh, it's just for you to understand and be able to dive in deeper. And this is really for you know, if you find one of these topics really intriguing, whether it be, you know, the cosmological argument, okay, we'll dive into that deeper. Uh, we're just kind of going to, we're going to lay the foundation for you to go further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so. We'll looking at the, the um, arguments against, like, yeah. these as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with, along with all the arguments, as we present them and evidence for them, we'll also be going through objections to the arguments. So saying like, hey, that's, what are you saying? You know, like that, those kind of things. We'll be going through those objections too because we want to make sure that you're equipped to know how to respond if someone comes against you when you're presenting your evidence. Okay, yeah. let's get into Dive the right first in. argument. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's that verse again. <laughs> All right, argument number one. The Kalam cosmological argument. By show of hands, has anyone heard of this? One person. <laughs> well, not Kalam. Ah, so we've heard of the, Kalam, we've heard of the cosmological argument. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. 
So no one else has heard of the Kalam cosmological argument. That's fine. It's because it's very philosophic, and, but it's super compelling when you understand it. So the Kalam cosmological argument goes as follows. One, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, you would think that's obvious, <laughs> right? You would think, duh. Like, of course, the universe began to exist. Therefore, it has a cause. But you'd be really surprised how many people come against this in their worldview. Whether or not they know it, especially in modern day understanding of our world, people think that all life is a cosmic accident, that we got here by chance from the result of millions of years of accidents and evolution which brought us to where we are today. Therefore, because we're some kind of cosmic mistake, there is no real purpose to your life. There is no real greater meaning beyond yourself than the one that you make for yourself. This is so ubiquitous. It's in Disney movies. Like this is what your children are listening to, you know? And like this, like these, this is the kind of cultural mantra that you hear all the time, but really smart people, way smarter than me, <laughs> have rigorously defended this argument. So you might at first be like, how is this an argument for God though? Like God isn't mentioned anywhere in this. So we're gonna get to that. The argument provides inferential evidence that if the universe at any point in the past began to exist, that something outside the universe had to have set the universe in motion in order for it to begin to exist. That's what the argument looks to prove. Mm -hmm. And so then we have to look at a couple things we're going to see in a minute, but I'm going to go ahead and state it now, is that uh, we see time, space, and matter, how we reconcile reality. All of those things are correlative, meaning they all came into existence at, all, at the same time, and they need each other to exist. Mm -hmm. um, when you start reconciling reality like that and actually breaking down uh, what we see observably, observably um, you start to be able to see the inner workings of God, right? So there had to be a time where time, space, and matter did not exist because time wasn't there, space wasn't there, and matter wasn't there. So then it all comes into being at the same time, uh, which we'll get into our, the further part of this argument. Yeah, so this first argument was developed by a Muslim uh, philo philosopher named Al-Ghazali, who concluded that the only logical explanation to uh, the past being non-finite would be that an agent that, uh, an agent that preceded the universe who had sufficient power to create the universe acting in order to set the universe in motion, right? So this, this is consistent, again, with any creator God. We're gonna narrow down to Christianity as God being the best explanation for reality in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and so part of that causality is that uh, experientially we know when there's a cause, there's an effect. This is like the dominoes. You hit the first one, we know the effect is gonna be that they all fall down. Yep, so that's how f premise one is uh, defended. It's mm -hmm. defended intuitively. Obviously, yeah. everything that begins to exist had to have had a cause to exist. Yeah. And we live in the cause and effect universe. Yeah. And that, that's what we're going into is that our universe is the exact same way. So uh, there's a first initial cause that created everything else. Right. We know that uh, as of the Big Bang. So and some of you, you know, maybe have not heard this argument for God through the Big Bang. But that's what we're going to state uh, as the cosmological side of the argument. So. Quick side note, the, the name Big Bang was originally coined as a joke against the idea that the universe all began, time, space, and matter all popped into existence at the same time. It was originally like intentionally meant to be prerogative, or not um, derogative, because uh, it, they said it gives way too much credence to the creationists. It says like, well, time, space, and matter all had a singular point in which they all began to exist. That sounds like someone saying, let there be light. <laughs> and then there was light. <laughs> the question was, doesn't the, the Big Bang presuppose that something had to have existed in order for it to bang? Right. Yes, it does. Now, it depends on which argument you're going for. Philosophers, it's so funny. I listened to a three-hour philosopher conversation where two philosophers and two scientists got up on the stage at the Veritas Forum, and they all go up, and they're talking about the definition of nothing <laughs> for three hours hours and when the creationists talk about everything was created out of nothing we mean nothing <laughs> like in the completely logical exactly what you'd think sense no thing when scientists more on the other side of the spectrum are thinking about it they're thinking of you know primordial elements like hydrogen and oxygen all existing in a vacuum 
but that would presuppose that time, space, and matter all had to have existed before the Big Bang, right? So if that's the case, then we would not see the resulting science that we have today as far as cosmological radiation and background. We should actually probably talk about that now. Yeah. And we'll come back. Well, and one quick aside to that too is uh, these scientists and, and philosophers, it, it gets really confusing because their terms don't always match. Yes. Uh, one of the things that the scientists will say is that nothing create, can create something and it, nothing also has a weight and all this sort of thing. And it's like, well, we would call that something that we don't understand, right? If it has a weight, there's probably something there you know, it's not really nothing. Um, the other part is this, of this is that we would say that time, space, and uh, matter are natural, nature, and then we would say that uh, God is uh, supernatural. So that means that he would have actually started all of this. He's the one that hit the dominoes and started it. So Yeah, and not only mm -hmm. that, to, to, to go along with this, you only are moving the problem one step further back by saying that something existed prior to the Big Bang. Because mm -hmm. how did that stuff begin to exist? At some point, there has to be a first cause to set it all into motion. By mm -hmm. setting it back another chain, we'll, we'll talk about this, but the, the idea of an infinite regress in the past is philosophically impossible. We would never arrive at the present if there was an infinite series of past events. Infinite series of past events never lead to today. So therefore, this argument is basically saying that in order for something to exist, it has to have an initial, first, uncaused cause. Otherwise, you're just moving the problem back further and further. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. You ready? <laughs> so prem premise two, yeah. which is the universe began to exist. Uh, many objections have been uh, thrown at this one. This is the most controversial point of the argument. Uh, basically, they get around it by arguing that the universe always existed infinitely in the past. This was a very, very popular argument against the Kalam for centuries. Uh, prior to the invention of the Hubble telescope and... Uh, you know, basically the scientific consensus today that at some point in the past, the universe began to exist. For millennia, there were people who thought, no, the, the Earth could be eternal, <clears throat> um, and therefore it would not need to have, to have begun to exist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the 20th century, massive scientific advancements in cosmology have resulted in the near universal acceptance of a beginning point to the universe. Uh, so we're gonna go on to uh, what uh, Frank Turk calls surge. Um, if you've never heard of him, Go watch him. He's amazing. Uh, we get a lot of information from him. He goes through this very extensively. We're going to go through it really quick. Um, so first off is the second law of thermo thermo thermodynamics. Everything is running down, uh, decaying, entropy. Uh, so this is like, basically, if you think of the Big Bang like a flashlight. And we were to set it here, turn it on, and we go home. We come back the next day. Is it going to be as bright as it was when we first turned it on? No, because the batteries are slowly losing energy. Um, we know that uh, our universe is just like that. Uh, we are actually going towards a heat death, um, which is essentially a long, long time from now, but it would be absolute zero. So that basically leads into there was a beginning and there's going to be an end. Um, secondly, the universe is expanding. Uh, we can observe this uh, and uh, we can see it through um, the telescopes that they have now that we can actually see that the universe is moving outwards, um, which would say that it had an original point. Um, then we go into the radiation afterglow or the redshift. So this is basically where we can actually see the heat starting to move out. And that would show that there's actually a point in time, if you look back, 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 it comes from a single point. Um, then we have the great galaxy seeds, uh, which is, they're all kind of like stepping stones to one another. Uh, this is the temperature variations. So this kind of goes in the fine tuning argument, which essentially means that if these temperature variations were not exact, our galaxies would not have been created. Um, and it's part of the Big Bang. Um, and then uh, finally we have Einstein's general relativity. Uh, again, time, space, matter, everything is co-relative. Um, they have to come to existence at the same time. Uh, Einstein wanted it to be an infinite universe at one point in time, but through uh, actually Hubble, he found out that, oh, that's not true. And so he actually had to take out some of his cheats in his equation, basically <laughs> dividing by zero, um, to be able to actually have a proper equation. Um, again, this is supernatural. This is what we say as, okay, it's outside of time, space, and matter had to start these things. Um, yeah, I, I just kind of wanted to go through this real quick. Uh, again, go see Frank Turk's videos because he goes through this so extensively and so well. Um, I do want to say one more thing about the entropy, though. Um, 
when we think about the Big Bang, you can literally think about it like an explosion. It's coming from a single point. And if you were to look at an explosion in slow motion, right, it's going to have an initial outward pressure. And you could actually see as it starts to move out, you could actually, if you could look at the heat waves, you could see that as well. Again, this is all stuff we do with telescopes and satellites that are taking these measurements all the time. So we're getting this huge picture of how our uh, solar system and galaxies and everything was created. So, yeah. And even before the science had caught up to the philosophy, uh, philosophers had been like defending the, co the Kalam cosmological argument for years. So basically the idea is, like we were talking about, an infinite series of regresses is impossible philosophically because you would never arrive at the present. If we had an infinite series of events in the past, it never had a beginning point. Why did we ever get to today? Why are we not on yesterday? Why are we not on tomorrow? If I were, imagine, this gets so confusing so, so quickly, but imagine because the word, we're, we're transposing from a concept, infinity, into reality, something that is finite. You can't transpose the idea of infinity, which actually is very mathematically um, advantageous for us, into reality because there can't be an infinite regress. Um, so imagine basically if you can say, let's say if I, you told someone to count down from infinity to zero, right? How exactly would you go about doing that? Infinity minus one. <laughs> <laughs> but, to, but to zero. How would you go from infinity to zero? <laughs> See, this, this, it's like, okay, so clearly you don't want to know this argument. <laughs> I'm just gonna pray for you, Dave. <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically, like, you can't do it. It's impossible because infinity is a concept. It's not an actual number. And so, again, an infinite series of regress in the past is impossible. Now, Christians, this is a side. This is not a part of the argument. But Christians believe in an infinite future. We believe in eternal life. There's nothing philosophically impossible about that so long as what sustained the first cause continues to sustain the future, right? So an infinite future, totally possible. An infinite past, impossible. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Again, Which it's, it's really confusing really quick. <laughs> yeah, it gets into our technicalities of technically the universe is dying, but if you're a Christian, you believe in all things being made new. So that's kind of our argument there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, uh, we can be uh, persuasively, um, excuse me, uh, therefore, because we can persuasively conclude the universe began to exist and that everything comes into existence has a cause, therefore the universe has a cause. So again, this goes back to the whole, you know, starting that first domino. Yep. Um, and then it must be something that exists apart from the universe that is not contained in the universe. Again, that goes back to the supernatural. We have to understand that something is outside of time-space reality. Which is um, what we call God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's our overarching argument from this side of it. Yeah. Um, we also have a verse to finish this uh, argument out with. Uh, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Yeah. So again, scripture backs up what the Kalam is stating, that mm -hmm. there was an initial cause that we were brought into existence, the universe was brought into an existence for a purpose, and that all things were created through him and for him. He is the purpose, he is the cause. So that's what uh, we want to argue. Now, objection. Now let's say somebody comes up to you and says, <laughs> that's ridiculous, what a load of bull. God, if God created everything, who created God? That's so common. Mm -hmm. And it's like the most foolish. <laughs> Well, it just means like you fundamentally don't understand the argument. Yeah, you just I mean, don't get the argument. Mm -hmm. If everything has to has a cause, if everything that has a cause, no, oh, if everything has a cause, doesn't that mean that God needs a cause to exist? Does anyone notice the problem with this objection? The issue with this objection is that it, it fundamentally misunderstands the argument. We're not arguing that everything that exists has to have a cause. We're arguing that everything that begins to exist has a cause. Christians have never ever claimed, and theists have never claimed, that God began to exist at some point in the past. Now, the, the Roman pagan gods or the gods of ancient Greece, they had an existent point at some point in the past, which obviously would make them not God. It makes them 
you know, higher demigods or, or greater beings, but they're not God. There has to be some kind of unmoved mover that exists before them in order for this argument to be sound, right? So Christians have never argued that God began to exist. Therefore, we've never claimed that God had to have been created. So whenever someone says, who made God? No one. And we've never argued that he did. That's how you respond. <laughs> that said, we're going to talk about this boy, Aristotle, who came up with a good response to this literally 300 years before Jesus. This guy lived, oh, almost 400 years before Jesus. This guy lived from 384 to 322. Obviously, everyone in here has heard of Aristotle, right? Awesome. He says, it is impossible that there should be an infinite series of movements, each of which is itself moved by something else, since in an infinite series there is no first term. What we talked about, an infinite series of regresses is impossible. If then everything that is in motion is moved by something, and the first, and the first movement is moved but not by anything else, it itself must be moved. It must be moved by itself. It, basically, he's just using very fancy language to say what we've already been saying, that God is the unmoved mover, that he put everything into motion, that he is the first initial cause which began all other subsequent causes. We all were put into existence by a self-existent being who created the universe for his glory. Now, again, Aristotle, like Al-Ghazali, was not a Christian, but he posited that a higher power or powers by which all other things have their being had to have existed prior to and outside of the universe in order for it all to begin. And again, we see this in Acts. Uh, Yet he, meaning God, is not actually far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. I'm actually talking about this this week at our, in Acts, our series here at New Heart. Um, so show up to church on Sunday. <laughs> and we'll talk some more about it. So we've kind of seen this argument. We've seen the objections behind it. This is the basis of, again, how do we reconcile reality? Well, we know that there's a cause and effect. So knowing that there is a cause and effect, we're going to get into the second argument, which is... Hold on, real quick. Before we get into the second argument, are there any oh, yeah. questions so far? We're only handling two arguments tonight, by the way, <laughs> just so you guys know. Because it is so heady, we're not trying mm. to have you drink from the fire hose. Well, we're going to do like a bunch. I was like, oh, no, we need to split this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This isn't really a question. Yeah. And that's a great, great point. Basically, what you're saying is that we need to be cautious of using super heady language in order to describe an argument because mm -hmm. we'll lose people really quick. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. a great point. And again, that's why we started with it depends on who your audience is mm -hmm. before you address these arguments. This argument, yes, is very philosophical, but it's really actually pretty easy to understand. Mm -hmm. It intuitively makes sense to say that if something started to exist, something had to have made that thing exist. You know, like I don't exist from myself. You know, like my parents got together 28 years ago, a little more, and now I'm here, right? And then their parents had got together and got them, and then so on, so on, so on, all the way back. So how did it all first start? It had to have started for some reason. And if we have to posit a reason, the only logical reason is that a creator put us all into existence. Mm -hmm. And that's what this argument is trying to provide. And I think one of the things you can do too, because you know, I, some of this is like, how do we talk to people who just say that they don't know or whatever, you know? Sometimes one of the best arguments is just to ask questions. Like, how do you reconcile reality? And then when they tell you how they reconcile reality, you pretty much gives you an understanding of, do they really understand these arguments or do I need to have a more simple conversation of just, hey, you know, the, here's the basic points of, of what I believe and how I believe the, you know, uh, reality exists. Um, I think that's a, a great way to start into those type of conversations. So it's a great point. Mm -hmm. Like seek to be, seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Yeah. You know, because again, we're not trying to win an argument. We're trying to win a person. Mm -hmm. We're trying to win them to Christ. Again, we're his ambassador. Yeah, sometimes the headier stuff is just for us because we love it and, you know, and enjoy it like, you know, and obviously all y'all do because you're here. So yeah. um, <laughs> a little bit of that, too. So. And again, if this just goes over your head, that's totally fine. Basically, the idea is like there are really smart people in the world who have defended your reason for believing in God. Mm -hmm. If you have persuasive arguments within yourself, share that. Like we are called to be witnesses to what the Lord has done in our lives. What the Lord has done in our lives has brought us to a really sound philosophical, scientific, theological reason as to why God makes sense. If that's not your story, that's okay. But have a reason mm -hmm. so that you can defend your faith to other people. Yeah. 
Speaking of other reasons, <laughs> this argument might be a little easier to grasp. <laughs> yeah, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so this is the argument of fine tuning. Um, so essentially this argument is uh, formed from uh, St. Thomas uh, Aquinas in 1273. Yes. So wherever complex design exists, there must have been a designer. Um, so again, this is just simple stuff that we can understand, right? Yep. Uh, nature is complex. It's extremely complex, and we're going to dive into some of that. Therefore, nature must have had an intelligent designer. Um, there's a common analogy about the watchmaker. Uh, so if you look at a watch and how intricate it is, uh, you would say, well, somebody clearly had to have made that, right? Um, so if the, if the universe is exponentially more exact on how it was designed, it should be obvious that there was a creator, right? There was a designer. Um, so that's one of them. Uh, again, you know, uh, maybe, maybe I'll go through the actual analogy, not just my <laughs> summation of it. But yeah. uh, if someone found a watch in the woods which shows uh, undeniably the design uh, by an intelligent mind, one would have to be a fool to conclude that the watch just so happened to be there for all of time and that it came to this spot in the exact formation by sheer chance. So why do we assume that the universe, which shows even more intricate design than the watch, uh, is the result of chance or uh, eternity? So again, that's just kind of the, the actual like phrase of it. Um, yeah, so, this was, the watchmaker yeah. analogy was first coined by William Paley in 1802. Mm -hmm. This guy, so handsome. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to read his quote? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So every indication of uh, contri uh, contrivance, every manifestation of design which existed in the watch exists in the works of nature, which the different, uh, with the difference on the side of nature, of being a greater or more, and that in a degree which exceeds all computation. Um, one of the ones that I love is the argument for DNA. DNA is extremely complicated. And uh, I actually saw this uh, witnessing tool where these people brought a kid's book and they showed it to people and it was very simple, you know, just a few words here and there. And they were like, if we told you that this just randomly happened in nature, like this book just formed somehow, right? Would you believe that? And of course, everyone's like, well, no, that's not going to happen. And they're like, okay, well, DNA is so much more complicated <laughs> than this. And with knowing that everything uh, regresses rather than uh, forms, you know, a pile of bricks is not going to create a house, but a house will go into a pile of bricks eventually. Um, we know that DNA would work the same way. It's not going to form into life. Um, so again, that just proves creator. Yeah, absolutely. For... Um, as much criticism as this argument has gotten, especially in the past 20 to like, well, 20 to 25 years, does anyone remember the, uh, the evolutionary slash intelligent design like trial from like 2005? Does anyone remember that? No? There was a massively controversial trial where basically the, the Supreme Court ruled that they're going to teach the theory of evolution to all children, but the, that all teachers were required to provide a statement before they started teaching it saying there is equally as much evidence for the uh, you know intelligent design argument therefore if you can check out these sources if you want to explore that argument further and like so many teachers quit like so many of them were just like this is ridiculous I'm not gonna teach religion in school and things like that it's like there's a huge push against the intent the um, uh, intelligent design argument in our in our day and age unfortunately but doesn't it just kind of intuitively make sense? Why would we expect for to see this incredible development of intelligent, appearingly, seemingly intelligent design from rear, from sheer random chance? You know, and I'm sure you could give a very profound and scientific reason as to why everything has to exist the way it does. Except I don't think philosophers are with you on that. And uh, here's a short video on the reason why. Uh, this video is only a couple minutes long, but we do want to show it to you guys because it, it beautifully explains the argument with the science in order to provide a reason as to why the objections also do not work. Pretty impressive argument, if you ask me. Not only that, is it, is it not philosophically probable that we would have a universe? It's, it's beyond all likelihood that any universe would exist at all. 
And it's funny because what he was talking about, the, uh, the multiverse argument, mm -hmm. he said it can't be proved, it can't be <clears throat> measured, it can't be observed. Sounds like God. <laughs> <laughs> like it's literally the exact same thing. You just have to believe it by absolute blind faith. No observation, no evidence. It's just there. So it sounds like your multiverse generator is just God. Like, wouldn't it just be more, more logical to explain the universe by a personal being instead of an impersonal one? I don't know. All that to say, I think they make a really good point of bringing up Psalm 19, 1 and 2. You know, again, the heavens do declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. It's funny that 3,000-year-old desert dwellers knew this before modern-day scientists. You know, and I don't say that to be pejorative or mocking. I say that because the universe does declare the glory of God. You look at Romans 1, and it's, it's obvious. God's handiwork is all around us, especially those who image him. There should be no reason why we exist other than a being that wants us to so that we may know him. Yeah. That's not a part of the fine-tuning argument. I just believe that strongly. <laughs> <laughs> um. So going back to the fine tuning argument, um, so there's over 30 known constants. If, if you get any takeaway from that video, just knowing that there are so many constants in this world that created life or that allow life to exist, I should say, um, is kind of one of those talking points that you can go to. Uh, you don't have to memorize everyone and exactly the uh, number that it's uh, no. to. So, um, but this is a callback to the surge argument because uh, this is just the explanation of something that was an explosion creating so much design is just unreal. And so now as we get into the fine tuning, we're gonna really see just how um, crazy this is. Yeah, so again, a lot of the objections that we would go through are what the video has already addressed. But again, the most common one you would get is what if the universe only appears to be designed because it can't be any other way. If it were any other way, life wouldn't exist so we could observe it, right? Again, according, the video says that there is no evidence for this. There is no logical reason as to why the gravitational constant or why the cosmological constant have to be what they are. In fact, it's, it's incredibly more likely that they wouldn't be the way they are. But yet, they are. And yet, here we are. It makes way more sense to posit a, a brilliant mind that exists outside of our universe which can bring the universe into existence. Yeah, and then so, again, I want to bring up the multiverse because I think it's something that is getting put into our media so much more with all the different shows and everything, and people are just... Looking at you, Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> They're just accepting it more and more as reality, and it couldn't be farther from the truth because we know that even if it were possible, there would still have to be something that is putting out the universes, like the video showed. Uh, another good talking point as you go to witness to people, and just for your own knowledge... Um, yeah, basically, again, it's just mathematically uh, incomprehensible. So, you know, it's just the chance is unreal. <laughs> so the fact that it would be multiple universes is just uh, silly in argumentation uh, again. So Yeah, and again, mm -hmm. you, you could just ask, what's your evidence? Mm -hmm. You know, and then wait. There isn't any. And, like, Googling a smart person really won't help. <laughs> there is no evidence for any ob objective other universe. We can't observe it. So how would we posit that it exists? So again, we got our argument there. Uh, second objection is, if the universe is so perfectly designed, why does it contain mistakes? This is something that the video did not address, but it's something that's probably good to know um, because things exist like tornadoes or cancer or you know, awful diseases or genetic mutations or things that don't have any real good cause in our universe. Um, we could even say things like, um, well, he would, yeah, you would ask. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so basically you would ask, like, what do you mean by mistake? So you have to, again, you have to start probing for not let me tell you what I think, but see how people reconcile reality. Um, so, uh, again, you know, he gave, gave some great examples. Why do things like tornadoes exist? Uh, why do things like the appendix in the human body exist? You know, it's like, okay, well, that's just, you know, we don't have a reason for it yet. Um, so, you know, this whole mistake uh, theory is it, it falls short again when you know the arguments for the Kalam and the fine tuning. So yeah, and then depending mm -hmm. on what they answer, you can then give your answer, right? Mm -hmm. So if they say something like, "Why does cancer exist? Why does suffering exist?" You can give a good answer as to why that exists. And again, we're going to go through that in a couple weeks. 
Um, but it, it depends on who your listener is, who your conversationalist is, so that you respond to them, not to an argument, right? And if you say something like, you know, if they say, like, why does the appendix exist? You know, there's no reason why that exists in our bodies. Because science doesn't know why it exists, doesn't therefore mean it's a mistake. Because we don't... Un really? Well, praise God. <laughs> yeah, so repeating what you said, just so people online, so it's a place when you get sick that the bad bacteria would go, or the good bacteria, okay, okay, the yeah. good bacteria would so, go. So apparently mm -hmm. there is a reason why we have a pancreas. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. they oh, pancreas, yeah, well, <laughs> appendix, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That'd be a different. Well, and so that goes back to the whole nothing argument, you know, people trying to say, well, nothing has weight and this and that, and it's like, well, maybe there is something there because obviously if you can prove it has weight and it creates or things come out of nothing, right, then that lends toward the argument of we just don't know yet. Um, so, again, that would be the mistake theory. So Yeah. The, the, the question was does science – well, first question was do science and the church conflict? Sure. No. In fact, the scientific revolution started because Christians believed we believe in a God who ordered our universe who can under, you know, order – we believe in a God of order, therefore we should be able to observe order in the universe, and therefore they sought to explain why our universe is so orderly, right? Now what you're talking about with Galileo specifically, we can address after this because it's getting late, but I'll talk to you about it unless anyone wants to know. Uh, Galileo, I'll just, I'll just say it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, Galileo was actually funded by the Catholic Church originally. He and the Pope were really good friends. But towards the end of his life, he started writing things that were kind of making the Pope sound like an idiot, and therefore he was under house arrest for the rest of his life. Gotcha. People want to take that to mean that everyone just rejected the heliocentric model, or you know. But in reality, that's not what happened. Like it's been misrepresented grievously, and I can send you a couple sources on that. When it comes to this argument, it just makes logical sense, and there's no evidence to the contrary. It seems as though we really are here as the product of intelligent design. Mm -hmm. For any further research on this, we recommend these topics, mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to the one on DNA, Darwin's Black Box by Michael Behe. He's, the guy, he's one of the scientists who helped decode the human genome, and brilliant book, very, very uh, pro-life, pro-scripture, pro-Jesus, so I definitely recommend that book. Yeah. Um, so is there any questions uh, before we end tonight, anything that you want to um, bring up or, or before we end tonight? So just to briefly repeat, you're saying that over the years, the scientific community has moved towards a believer mindset. Is that kind of where you're going? Yeah, I mean, I've heard mm -hmm. that. I'm not an ISIS. I didn't. I kind of want to know if you have an opinion on whether that's accurate or not. Well, now, on the basis of these arguments, a lot of people have moved towards creationist. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't always mean a deist or, you know, that they believe in a uh, designer necessarily, but they believe that... Um, it had to start from somewhere. The, again, they'll go back to the agnostic side of things where I just don't know, but I know that there is intricate design, right? Um, they won't say necessarily God, but they will say creation, right? Um, so there's a lot of that going on. There's still a lot of um, Christian scientists, yes, um, and then there's a lot of people that really hardly oppose too, like the nothing theory that uh, is, is very... Um, Intriguing. I'll put it that way. Um, again, if you watch Frank Turek, uh, he you beat your head against the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch Frank Turek, he actually shows uh, how that theory basically falls flat. Um, but again, you know, it's it's still a mixed bag, I would say. But uh, a lot more people are towards creationists now that we have all these things from the calm cosmo calm cosmological argument. Can't get it all out. Words are hard. <laughs> I know too many big words tonight already. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll respond too. I, I don't know the exact statistics. I know that the vast majority of the academy are still anti-religious establishment and anti, you know, the even idea of God being brought up legitimately as a theory within the scientific community. It's still the vast majority are against it. The number of uh, theists in the fields, the individual fields of science is always shifting. But there is a general uptick, especially in like biblical studies and the, the, the more specifically scripture-based um, areas, like revolutions in philosophy and in textual criticism and things like that that are 
super encouraging. When it comes to science specifically, I can't give you a specific number. Um, Emily. Again, we need to be really careful about who and how we're presenting this argument to. Mm -hmm. um, because again, it, it comes down to you need to be an apologist to them, you know, for Christ, obviously, but to them. The vast majority of people you're going to talk to are not going to be like, explain why the gravitational constant has to be this way. Like, they're <laughs> not going to talk like that. Most people are going to ask, why couldn't there be other universes where, you know, life exists? And you can just tell them, well, there's no evidence for it. It's a way easier way to say what we've gone to the trouble of proving. That said, we are to be ambassadors for Christ, to go back to what we talked about originally. And then um, what Eric said about uh, people hearing this and they don't necessarily want to believe it. They just choose not to because they want to do their own thing and they would be beholden to a rule, a lawgiver. Um, that may be the truth internally, but I would never accuse someone of that. Because I think when you assume motives in people, you immediately turn them off to your presentation. You know, it's, it's like, there's nothing in the world, Danielle knows, there's nothing in the world more frustrating to me than misrepresentation. Like you should always, always try to ask people, what do you believe? And then try to restate in your own words what you think they said. Just to make sure, hey, if I understand you correctly, this is what I'm hearing you say, is this right? And when they say yes, okay, now we can talk through it. But until then, I don't ever want to approach an, a conversation with someone and assume, oh, you believe, you don't believe because, and I'm not saying this is what you're saying, I'm saying that this is what a lot of people do. You're saying that because you reject the scientific evidence that you morally don't want to accept the lawgiver. And that's just too far a leap to make, you know? And it's really rude. <laughs> yeah, well, and one thing I was gonna say, I think I actually missed it in the, in the uh, PowerPoint here, but uh, we also had an example of like, you know, when you're talking to an atheist, one of the things you can ask is like, if I give you these, like, what is the thing that you need to believe in God? And they may say, you know, this or that point. And there's, you know, even if you give that to them, they're still not always gonna believe. It's all about the heart posture, right? And we've even heard atheists like say, okay, well, you know, what if you go meet your creator? What are, what are you going to say? And they'll say, well, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind, which is so crazy to think. <laughs> like, okay, you're going to give the guy who gave you life a piece of your mind? Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Up but, on your high horse. <laughs> yeah. But again, it just all back to heart posture. You know, we love going into this heady knowledge and being able to say, okay, we understand these concepts and that we can present them accurately. But again, just all back to that heart posture of who needs to hear this how do they need to be presenting the information? And again, like what he said, asking the intentional questions. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And, and maybe, maybe you ask them, you, before they even get into the conversation, just ask like, hey, if Christianity were true, would you believe it? Because a lot of people will answer no. I, I don't want to believe it. Well, at that point, why are you trying to argue for it? Mm -hmm. You already have someone who shut, all, shut down completely to the argument. All right, then pray for them. Pray that the Lord would soften their heart. And yeah, if you get the opportunity to plant that seed, like the parable of the sower, I'm going to be talking about all this this week, <laughs> but the, the parable of the sower, you know, it might, the seed might fall on rocky ground. Okay, that's fine. It's not your job to make it grow. But it's also not your job to defend an argument that someone doesn't care to hear. You know, it's like, just have wisdom. Don't throw your pearls before pigs. But don't withhold the seed because you don't feel like their soil is right. Just have wisdom. There's not a one-size-fits-all <laughs> mm -hmm. situation. Just listen to the Holy Spirit. Walk in like Christ-likeness before them and do your best. Yeah. That's really the most I can say about it. Well, we're getting close to time here, so let's go ahead and uh, pray, and then we'll show the, the test uh, where yeah. you can get that. So, mm -hmm. um, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to all come here together and be able to just learn more of who you are in this great design in which you've presented us with, Lord. Just thank you for uh, being so intentional with us and loving us so much that you would create such a universe that we could exist in, Lord. We just, we love you and we want to be able to share you with, with anyone that's willing to hear. Lord, just give us wisdom and discernment as we leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. If anyone wants to take the test, it's available here. <laughs>